Welcome to the Alouettes Flight Deck, the podcast dedicated to Montreal Alouettes football. I'm Cliffy D, and you can find me on Twitter at Cliffy D. And I'm Tim Capper. You can also find me on Twitter, but at Repact. That's R-E-P-P-A-C-T. And this episode of the podcast is presented by our good friends over at SportBuff, where if you use the promo code FLIGHTDECK-10 at checkout, you'll get 10% off your entire order. So head over to sportbuffshop.com, use the code, save some money, and rep your your team's uh, rep the merch of your favorite team. And you can find the Alouette's Flight Deck all over social media. Be sure to give us a follow on Twitter at Alouette's FL Deck. You can also check us out on Instagram at Alouette's Flight Deck. Find us on Facebook at Alouette's Flight Deck Pod. And yes, folks, you can even listen to the Flight Deck on YouTube. Head on over to youtube.com slash Alouette's Flight Deck, where you can see videos, you can see hear episodes, and make sure you check us out. Give us a like, give us a subscribe. We, we'd love to have you on board as we go bigger and better than ever before. And make sure, if you haven't already, check out the Alouette's Flight Deck merch store at teespring.com slash stores slash Al's Flight Deck. Make sure you get your merch, rep the podcast, and get ready, folks, because the playoffs are a-coming. They're a-coming. Also, I want to congratulate uh, Julia Weigel, who won the pair of uh, Sport Buff flight crew seats to see the Alouettes play the uh, Ottawa Red Blacks in the Thanksgiving Day Classic this Monday. Monday, Monday, Monday at 1 p.m. over at Purcell Molson Stadium. Uh, the season finale, the home finale, rather. Tickets for those will be available via contest in the next couple of weeks. It will be our normal way of doing it. Um, <clears throat> it will not be via Twitter, but it will be our normal way. But stay tuned to, for the links. But for that uh, game, um, we will make sure that we mention it right uh, on the show prior to the contest heading uh, being given out. So, um, yeah. So, hey, I, uh, I know many people have had great time being in the stadium this year. Thanks to the guys again over, over at Sport Buff for partnering with us on these uh, on these tickets for this year. So, and what better way, man? But we got we'll be talking about that in a little bit later. Um, also, we wanted to help preview the game. We have brought in Janine from the Mouchoir Podcast. Um, we'll be talking with her in a little bit. Um, I love it. This woman knows her football. She knows her stuff, and uh, being able to hear her and and. Uh, uh, her new crew, uh, you know, over at uh, over the pod, over their pod, it's uh, it's always fun talking to her. So it's uh, stay tuned for that con- stay tuned for that conversation. So, <laughs> um, okay, okay, wow. Um, if you were to give me one word, Cliff, to describe how this game went, what would it be? Versus that versus the Elks, what would it be? <sighs> Fortunus? <laughs> That's yeah. <laughs> is that a word? It, that is a word. Not, okay, then yes. I hate to say it, folks, but the Alouettes were incredibly lucky to get out of Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton with the W last week. Oh my! It started so ugly. It it, it was just. I, it got, gave me shades of that uh, game versus Hamilton, the last, uh, the third matchup this year between Hamilton and Montreal yeah. and Percival Molson, mm-hmm. where the first half was just a dog's breakfast as far as how the Alouettes were playing. But then the second half came along, and you, you see, okay, they kind of realize, all right, we 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 got to get our act together, we got to we got to figure this out, and they started slowly doing it, but also at the same time letting the Elks hang around. And giving them hope that maybe, just maybe, they can finally get off that schneid and finally get their first win since, what was it 2019 at home? Mm-hmm. I, I, I really, truly thought it was going to happen. I mean, both teams just did not play great football overall. They had lots of moments of really awesome, like really awesome plays here and there. But it just didn't feel like... Either team truly really wanted to win this game. Like I even said at one point, the Elwets do not deserve to win this game. And I thought for sure at that point, they're just going to do something stupid and hand the ball over to Edmonton. And this is just a foregone conclusion. But lo and behold, 
This defense, man, this mm-hmm. defense bailed out Trevor Harris and the offense big time. They bailed out David Cote big time. Mm-hmm. This defense came to play in the fourth quarter and they were out standing just they, they absolutely came to play outstanding the, they, they came to play in the second half i mean you know this team has, hasn't shut out a team hadn't shut out a team in the second half since 2019 I which mean, is no easy feat in football period no and let's face it the the elks have quite a few solid weapons uh, i i see what they're doing and there's definitely a lot to like. There's a lot to be positive about if you're looking – when you're thinking about the future of the Edmonton Elks and fans there should be really excited, especially with Taylor Cornelius. I mean that guy is a baller big time. Mm-hmm. He he made plays happen, uh, you know, throwing the ball, uh, <laughs> running with the ball too. Like he had a couple of nice uh, carries. Like just tucked under his arm and just went for a run and just – he really tested this Alouette's defense. I mean, I mean Edmonton really – it really looked like they were going to pull it off, but this defense just, as you said, came alive, shut them out, shut out the Elks in the second half, mm-hmm. made outstanding plays, including what turned out to be the game-winning touchdown. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I know you're saying, but wait, the defense scored the game-winning touchdown? Yes, folks. The defense, the Alouette's defense, and on 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 a goal line stand practically because. Uh, Edmonton had managed to march all the way down to, I think, the th- the four or five yard line. And Taylor Cornelius, for whatever reason, decided to drop back for a pass, threw with all of his might. And unfortunately, the mighty paws of uh, Darius Pickett were up in the air, smacked the ball up, kind of like a, a fly ball in center field. And sure enough, Tyrese Beverett put his glove up, caught the ball, and he went to the house 100 yards for the pick six. I know. It was, it was amazing. I mean, Al's first pick six, I think, since the late 90s. Um, I think it was it 99 or 98. I'm, I'm trying to remember what it was. But, uh, um, yeah. Uh, it, what are you talking about? Uh, Najee Murray had a pick six last year. No, no, no. Of 100 yards. Oh, of 100 yards. Okay. 100 so, yards. See, you got to clarify that. To take, yeah, to take nothing <laughs> against. Yeah, not to, take, not to take anything away from the guys who've done it before, but – to, you know, hundred hundred yard. Either way, hundred yards is nuts. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it was, oh, actually, it was Baron Miles. I think Baron Miles was the last one to do it with a hundred yards. Um, it's only been three in Al's history, so uh, this being this being I mean, this being the third. Yeah, and poor Tyrese. I really hope they had oxygen on the side of the lines for because he had been <laughs> sucking wind. He was fierce. sucking it for a while. <laughs> and the worst part is, you got to go back when, when a defense scores a touchdown. You got to go back out there in a bit. <laughs> yeah. And I know we, I know we're jumping ahead a little bit to this, but we have to. But just the way that he got into the end zone, because he, dude, he was almost run down by Kevin, by uh, a running back, uh, Elks running back, Kevin Brown. Yeah. He almost and, did, but then there was a little, little bit of a juke, a little bit of a jive. You know? Oh, yeah. It was because I think I, I think Cornelius went down, was down there too. I think T- Taylor Cornelius was down there also. He he was almost like stride for stride with Beverett, yeah. and then uh, I think it was Jamal Davis that was kind of running beside him, or mm-hmm. it was a picket. One of the two, we were kind of running like side by side, just you know, just enough to run interference. So like exactly, just enough Beverett to move it, go a little bit to the left, move back to the right, and go in, go on into the end zone. So and then yeah, you're right. Kevin Brown came came out like a, like a ball of fire. No like, kidding, he was running eh? to try. And sure enough, Beverett, I don't know if uh, someone had kind of gave him the high sign, like, oh, by the way, incoming. So he stopped, almost like turned on a dime practically, let Brown blow by him, and then just a little... I know, I know. Into the house. Unbelievable. That, Unbelievable. That third eye or that peripheral vision of his, I'm sure, is something. Or, or as I said, maybe somebody said something, but... Had that, to, because... And we, and we got to get, by the way... We got to get props too, because the Alouettes at that point were only were only up six. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, no, no, sorry, they were up five. Yeah, they're at five at that point. When's it? When's the last time you've seen a, an easy two, the easiest two point convert by an Alouettes quarterback? Yep, yep. Uh, just a nice little scamper by Trevor Harris, and like I said, he did not play his best game, but no, no the no, moments no. that he did have where he looked good, he definitely looked good, and. Just yeah, he he called his own number. He's like, "F it, I'm going to take it. It's mine." And sure enough, he oh, scampered just, into the end zone it, for the it, yeah. for the two points. Yeah. Um, if you don't know the score already, it was 25-18 for the Alouettes. Uh, again, they shut out the Elks in the uh, second half. You know, the way the first half was going, the Owls were up by ten. 
And then they blew that lead. And I was thinking, oh, no. You know, not necessarily shades of when Edmonton was here earlier in the year, uh, that 19-point mm-hmm. collapse. Yep. But it's still, it was like, oh, man. You had that deja vu feeling. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I really did. I mean, it's, um, but man, <laughs> this, this is a game that the Alouettes did need. They really did. You know, we didn't want to get caught in a trap game. You know, in there, really, if you've been following the Alouettes as long as we have, you know that there are these moments in Alouettes history that, that you know, that they have been involved in big things. Obviously, this was a big thing because Edmonton was coming in, tied with the pro football record for longest losing home losing streak. The Owls didn't want to be the the the, the bearer of good news for the Elks to let them get their first win. Yeah. You know, we feel we, we went through it ourselves. We went through a losing streak ourselves a few years back, obviously. We feel for them. Yeah. But you know what? It, it's let you know, I, I joke, but let Edmonton have this have this have this banner. You know, they, they need another banner in the city of champions. They can have, there this. You go. they can have, <laughs> they can have this one. Um, you know, with their loss, yeah. they, they did set the new CFL record for longest home losing streak. In, uh, pro sports too, if I'm not mistaken. You are correct, sir, actually. Uh, pro football. I think it's pro oh, football. Pro football, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, pro, pro football. football. I mean, not exactly the, that's, you know, pretty dubious honor, unfortunately. And, you know, I, I feel for like our friends over at the turf district, like, I mean, they, they deserve to see a home win. Just, mm-hmm. Obviously, we didn't want it to come at our expense, and thankfully it didn't. But, I mean, like, y- you got to feel for those guys and gals. I mean, it- it's got to be tough. And for Edmonton fans, too, like, they want to see a winner. They And you can make all the excuses you want, you know, and talk about, okay, listen, the pieces are in place. You know, this is a Chris Jones team. This is how, it, you know, this is his modus operandi is you got to – as he's, you know, constantly tinkering with the roster and finding the pieces that fit and, you know, shaping this into the image that he expects out of this team. And yeah, usually that first year is going to be just hot garbage. I mean, Saskatchewan fans, you know, you, you've, you've been through it yourself too with Chris Jones at the helm and now Edmonton, it's, it's their turn again to have to kind of eat humble pie and just kind of suffer through this year in the hopes that, as he's retooling and as he's making the moves that he needs to make, uh, that Chris Jones will get it figured out, and eventually the team will start winning. Eventually the Elks will win a game at Commonwealth Stadium. Mm-hmm. Will it be this year? I mean, got, I think they got two more chances, so it's yep. possible. Yep, I think they will. I, mean, I think they will. I think I said it earlier, earlier. <coughs> excuse me, earlier in the year that that the Elks would end up breaking their streak. So, well, here's hoping for their sake and for the sake of their fans because they deserve better. And I am so sick and tired of going online and people in Edmonton talking about this supposed curse. Like ever since they changed the name, the team is cursed and and enough. Like you're grown ass people. Curses don't exist. It's not real. Okay. I mean, it's just the the way this team is currently being run and operated. I mean, there's, there's so many moving pieces here. I mean, it sucks. I get it. We, as you said, Tim, we've been there. The losing streak at home sucks. Just the losing streak period sucks. Yeah. But this, and what people need to remember, this goes back to 2019. And was exactly. that the first, was that the first year when they changed their name? Nope. No, see, nope. exactly. See, you just proved my point. <laughs> right. About, were... Or uniforms. Okay. They haven't won in that Elks, the Elks new or, unis. Or new name. I mean, that's. Yeah. Or new name. So, Cur- the curse, it go- there's no curse. It, it's childish. Stop it, people. You're better. I, I expect you to be better than that. Be better. Yeah. Um, and yes, you were right. You know, Trevor Harris was, it, it was b- bad Trevor. Uh, I mean, still, dude, I mean, 82% percentile on his passes. I mean, 14 to 17, but it was only for 180 yards. You know, I get, I get but, but no picks. No picks. Uh, I, I, no, but forced fumbles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that you got, you got to admit, and we'll, and we'll get to that. But that I have to I mean, talk about yeah. his other stat, dude. He had one touchdown and what? One touch. Oh, my God. Touchdown. <sighs> that was. I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Eugene Lewis is a goddamn magician. I don't know how he pulls these tutties out of his ass, but my God, he does. And they're so beautiful. And everybody, everybody league wide was losing their damn mind with this one-handed snag. Considering DPI should have been called. 100%. I was like, where's the flag? I, I, I mean, he practically carried the defender into the end zone with him. 
He's like, hey, buddy, come along for the ride. I'm going to catch a touchdown. Sure enough, yoink. Yeah, there that, it is. That's hilarious. I was just about to say yoink, too. <laughs> that's hilarious. And, and, and I, I have to laugh, too, because that throw from Trevor was – very reminiscent of Ricky Ray, like that teardrop mm-hmm. pass that he mm-hmm. did so well that he made a, a a multiple Grey Cup champion winning career out of. Like he he, he must have learned that from Ricky Ray because uh, he dropped it in the basket like yeah. absolutely perfect. And, and, the, and yeah, yeah. The Al- and, and this is what we come to expect out of Trevor Harris. Like we we want to see more of that Trevor Harris, not the Trevor Harris that you know just looks lost and confused at times and just does like. You know, the bare minimum. Like, why can't we get that Trevor Harris, the one that's throwing beautiful strikes and making the right plays? I mean, that, that's the frustrating part more than anything else. Like, but, we want to get behind this guy so badly. Right. But at the same time, like, when he just kind of half asses it through the first half of the game, and you just hope and pray that he's he does remember to flip the switch that makes him a good quarterback. Well, I, I mean, and, that, and you're going you're gonna to get those who are going to say, Cliff, they're going to say, but Cliff, Tim, you're ragging, you're ragging on Trevor. Yes, he didn't do it, but you're winning. You're winning. You've won, was it five of six now? Was it five of six? Five of six? Yeah, Yeah, you've won five of six. But can we honestly conclusively say that any of those wins were because of the quarterback play of Trevor Harris? I gotta gotta look at the wins. Uh, I mean, mean, if, if we're being honest, we're calling it what it is. I have to say maybe the game against BC, he looked fairly organized and yeah. So maybe one. Yeah, one out of the, yeah, we're at twenty one ten at one. Uh, it was, yeah, it was twenty one ten at one point. Yep. So actually, no, it wasn't eighteen three. Something like that. Either way, it was a, it was a lead. But a, yes, that that game, I, I would one hundred percent give him his flowers. He he definitely looked like a you know starting top tier quarterback in that game. The rest, he's had spurts of good and series of bad, and it was I'd say pretty much like okay and. I'm yeah, sorry to was, say, no, no, he was just okay. I will admit he was okay, but he had enough behind him. As I said, everybody got together and they got the, got the Alice's win. You know, they were stagnant in the second half. The offense was stagnant in the second half. Big time. And I mean, yes, you've got Eugene Lewis making insane catches here, there, and everywhere. Uh, K on Julian Grant, uh, he finally got involved in the offense. Uh, Tyson Philpot had himself a nice little run. Yeah. Uh, just absolute beautiful catch and run there. Also, what about that? And okay, to go back to Trevor, mm-hmm. because he had that one pass at the beginning of the, of the he had that one pass at the beginning of the game where he had a, a, an Elks defender all over him, but he oh, just the- tossed the ball up, not into coverage, but there was Gino right where he needed to be. Yep, Johnny on the spot. Yeah, so I see, I see, it almost it almost seemed seemed planned. Because, you know, because the way that, it, again, it wasn't as if he just tossed up a prayer. I think no. he saw Gino exactly running his route. And bought just enough time for him to get to right. where he needed to be. And then just at the very last second. And again, maybe this is why he does hold on to the ball too long. Because he really thinks in his head, okay, wait for it, wait for it. This is the time now. And then throws it. And, we've, and again, you know, this week, it, you know, as the stats weren't pretty, um, the defense came through, got us the win. Uh, not only with the pick six, but also uh, the stop on downs, and then the the other interception late in the fourth. Oh yeah, the the now that that was a throw that I think Cornelius would like to have back because it just tipped off the hands of Danny Vandervoort and right into the, exactly. the waiting arms of Micah Alway. Just and called game. That's really what it was. It, it was, was like yeah. And Edmonton had every opportunity to at least make the comeback, try to do something to at least get down back in the end zone and. This this was reeling off of that that goal line stand, like literally on Montreal's three yard line, denied not once, not twice, but three times by this defense. Absolutely outstanding, mm-hmm. just outstanding work from oh, this defense. Oh, I know, I know. Even it's funny. Even the even the uh, the guys on TSN during the broadcast pointed it out. They they were stacking eight and nine deep while, while they were at the, on the goal line for that for that drive and it stopped them, and just stopped them. Um, uh, yeah, Walter Fletcher, uh, if you happen to miss it, he was with us last week, so make sure you go back and you check out our archive over at ilowitzflighttech.ca. Mm-hmm. Uh, 12 carries, 67 yards, a decent 5.6 average. Um, Phil Pot, his <laughs> the trickeration man, <laughs> 16 yards. By the way, so as of we're taping, because with the Alouettes schedule this week, uh, practicing, they only practice Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 
um, Friday, by the way, at Percival Molson. And Saturday, if you haven't been to a practice yet, head over to the Big O and watch these guys practice. So we currently don't know the current status of Tyson Philpott because he left late-ish in the game with a potential lower leg injury. We don't know what it is, so we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Um, but, but still, um, and Jeshwin Antwi, six carries, 23 yards. You know, it wasn't the best thing. I mean, Fletcher's longest ru- longest rush was 11 yards. But, he, you know, he did what he had to do. Dominic Davis, you know, did what he needed to do. Yeah, he, he got a t- into he, the end zone. Yeah, got a tutty. I don't know if I'm not mistaken because I'm waiting for clarification. He is one short of the Alouettes record for most rushing touchdowns in a season by an Alouettes quarterback. And that one was set in 29. Currently, if, if I remember correctly, it was set at 12 by Vernon Adams. Um, and I think the CFO record is either 13 or 14 set by Doug Flutie. Now, what did you think of uh, you know, thank the with uh, Davis's touchdown? That mm-hmm. was as a result. It should have been Walter Fletcher scoring his, a touchdown. Yes, yes. What a I run, think, by the way. Amazing run. Amazing. A great run, but I don't agree with the fumble. I, I don't think like he, I think the ball broke the plane before he fumbled it. I mean, no, I've seen, I'm, I'm on the opposite side as you, but continue. Okay, well. Yes, he did not have control of the ball. I could probably make that argument, and maybe that's kind of how the uh, command center looked at it. But I, I really thought, uh, just looking at it, he it looked like he had broken the plane and then started to let go of the ball, like thinking, okay, he'd already scored a touchdown. And I've seen that in the past, too, where mm-hmm. you know it's good enough for the officials to consider that a touchdown, but to call that a fumble, I thought was, no, no. It was like, from the way I saw it. It actually was slapped out of his hand. He was fumbling as he was crossing the the goal line. Um, so no, I had no problem with that. I had no problem. But um, to me, what was more impressive was him making that leap to get to the goal line. Exactly. I mean, that it, was that was. I mean, yes, we wish Fletch had gotten the touchdown, but still, just just the effort, just the effort alone was yeah. something. No, absolutely. And again, we, we've talked about this, folks. Like, podcast karma has to be a thing. And <laughs> we, I, I feel bad because Fletch, unfortunately, did fumble again and it ended up turning the ball yeah. over. Yeah. So we always talk about the podcast karma and we really wanted it to be a thing for, for Fletch this past Saturday and didn't quite work out. So we're hopefully, you know, he'll get a chance. He'll get back on. He'll get back on his horse. He'll be good again. We'll give him a bye week. It's fine. You can, he can do it this week. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Hey, we remember if, it, if people remember Alouettes on Thanksgiving, the Alouettes have had some amazing performances on Thanksgiving. This is true. Even being, if people remember, AC setting at the, the setting at the time, well, setting the the all time passing record in the CFL, and then what was the all time passing record in the in pro football at that time? That's right. He did that on Thanksgiving. We've had some other ones too. I, I think we had. Uh, wasn't it one of the games when, um, yeah, it was one of the games when um, um, Stambeck went off. Uh, was it Stambeck that uh, went off? Uh, no, you're I, thinking, I, if you're thinking of last think? year's game, it was uh, Cameron Artis Payne. Yeah, it was Cameron Artis Payne, yes. But we've had some great, anyways, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, yeah, as I said, me- mediocre, but I mean, we needed to be done. We were over- able to overcome things, including penalties. Ugh, penalties. <laughs> and we talked about this. Only one was DPI, by the way. That was <laughs> that was a good thing. I think only one was DPI. Yeah, yeah. And the feast lying in the end zone with, uh, you know, pretty much set up the Elks for their touchdown. Mm-hmm. Like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's fin- let me finish here with the stats here before we get to that. Um, yeah, uh, for receptions, the leading recep- receiver was Eugene Lewis. Uh, three catches, 52 yards. Reggie White had the longest catch of the day. He had 41 yards. And he had his long, the longest was 25 cat at uh, 25 yards, so two catches. Uh, Fletcher had three catches for 29 yards. Uh, KJG uh, had uh, two receptions, 21 yards. Uh, Winicky had two receptions, 17, and and Herdy Mayala had uh, two for 20. Um, yeah, as I said, it was just it was just meh, it was just there. Yeah, and we also got to address the elephant in the room with David Cote, and but not so much with his kicking, but the decision to go for not one, not two, but three 
50 yard plus field goals. Well, I want to know what's the, what, what was the, okay. First, we need to talk about, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know what, let's go with that. Let's go with that first, because I was going to talk about what could have been at halftime. You know, yes, Cote kicked another field goal to get the Owls within one. But if it hadn't been for the OPI on Reggie White, that would have been a touchdown. It absolutely would have. And yeah, I mean, a lot of people say, well, that's a football play. And to a, de- to a degree, it he is. He got but caught. <laughs> it don't was, do it in front of the ref. Yeah, I must say, it was blatant as hell, too. I mean, gee, yeah. they didn't call the DPI in the other one. But, you know, I guess they, it was a makeup call. Oh, right. <laughs> Give the man back his wallet. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that, that was unfortunate. But I mean, that that's football. That, you know, it happens. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah, the the Cote thing, I don't understand the – I mean, I don't understand the 56-yarder. No, especially when it was third and – you know, I, I won't say third and manageable, but I mean, like, I, I think if if, you, if, it, if there was ever a time to go for, like, a, some special teams trickery, that too would have been the time to go for it. I mean, oh, my goodness. Like, a 56 yard that's a big ask. I mean – yeah, okay, he had just made a, a 52-yard field goal after bricking a 50-yarder, but th- these you're putting a lot of pressure on a, a kicker, like an undue pressure, too. Dude, like, it could have been worse. It could, it could have been like the, ki- the, the kick in London this past weekend between uh, uh, Minnesota and New Orleans. Oh, the double doink? The double doink. Whew, yeah. Could have been worse. But the – and again, here's the risk, though. I mean, with both of Cote's missed field goals – Christian Salisbury was able to bring it out, so there's no rouge, and also was able to. I think both times was able to put the uh, the Elks in decent field position. Like oh, yeah, this guy was yeah, hard yeah. to he was hard to hold. I yeah, mean, he, true. He, he was difficult to stop. Mm-hmm. I, I so I would almost rather at that point, like even a turnover on downs at midfield, rather than trying to you know force your kicker to make a 56 yarder like. I, I, he I got just close. Like, he got close. I guess there was more wind than we expected. You know, wind is actually it was actually an issue, <laughs> somewhat. Well, with that in <laughs> mind too, that's all the more reason to go for it on third down. Then, I mean, you know what they say: no risk it, no biscuit. I mean, I mean, especially too, if Trevor is you know his completion rating is so great, which of course, as I said, pad his stats. That's fine, but I don't know. To me, it just felt like uh, Machocho was just playing with fire on. Both those instances where Cote missed the field goal, and who ends up wearing the goat horns? It's Cote. Yeah, if anything, this is probably his one of his worst games this season. Which you know, but it didn't. You know, for the first time, you know, you usually say you know he missed that many field goals is going to come back to bite you in the ass. It, it didn't. It didn't. We're, we're lucky enough. It did not come back to bite us in the ass. Well, see, that, that's the key word, lucky. And yeah, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. But man, you do not want to make that your strategy going into a football game. It's like, no, no, no. Well, no. I hope we're luckier <laughs> than the other team. Like, yeah, it's it's not a recipe for success. But you know what? It, it's fine. I mean, Cote made a fifty-two. Um, so he was actually short because I couldn't tell. So he was wide. Sorry, he was wide left on the fifty-six yarder. Mm. Um, yeah. Again, uh, it's. I guess they're trying something different. I mean, including, and which is funny, came out of nowhere, was the fake punt by the Alouettes. Oh, yeah. That Hot came out head. of nowhere. And what is funny, and I don't know if you remember seeing a cliff at, at season ticket holder day, they ran that play. They ran that play during practice. I don't remember if you remember seeing it or not, but they ran that play, that exact same play. So they had been itching for a moment to be able to use that and just... You know, kudos. They, they they caught the elk snapping. That was yeah, and I think I think it was Philpot. I think it was Philpot that ran it. Uh, yes. No, 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 no. I mean, in practice. I'm trying to remember in practice. Oh, in, yes, in practice. So, and, and so that, again, cr- credit to Byron Archambault for uh, you know just absolutely fantastic. Uh, I mean, he's done outstanding work as far as I'm concerned with the uh, special teams this year. Uh, my goodness, I mean. To come up with plays like that, just to, as I said, just catch everybody with their pants down and keep the drive alive. That's the key is mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, taking advantage of opportunities like that. That's why it was so frustrating. As I said, for, uh, it was why wouldn't you wait? Instead of going for a 56 yard field goal, why wouldn't you come up with another kind of razzle dazzle play to and hope to catch the Elks snapping again? I mean, at that point, like <laughs> I would have almost rather that than risking. Christian Salisbury returning. And let's not forget his two missed field goals, 70 yards. So 
a 35 yard average of, of return. I mean, that that's a lot of real estate to give up. Yeah, no, I know. Hey, it's frustrating to just looking here after they ran the, the, the fake punt, the next play forced. <laughs> that's when Fletcher fumbled the ball. Yeah. <sighs> and that was in the third. That was in the thick of it. That's that's uh, no, that was in the oh, second. That was in the second quarter. Yes. So, um, we got to, you know, we got to give props. I know we've been talking about all about defense and, and, and offense and stuff like that. By the way, real quickly, um, um, I have it here. Uh, Taylor Cornelius, 16 to 28, 273 yards, no touchdowns, but two picks. Those came at in really inopportune times for them in the fourth quarter. Uh, mm-hmm. Kevin Brown had an amazing game. I mean, you know, uh, very on par. With with Walter, I know we were saying he didn't have a good game, but very almost almost same on par with with Walter Fletcher. I mean, he was uh, seventy five yards and fourteen carries. Yeah. So I mean, in that sense, yeah, the, the two of them were neck and neck. It, the big key though is the fumbles. <laughs> I know, I know. And then Dylan Mitchell was the leading receiver for for the Elks, stepping in, you know, for Daryl Walker, which had a semi good game, but Kenny Lawler, who just he went out with that uh, that horrible injury. So. Yeah, and that was just after coming back too with mm-hmm. uh, from another injury, <clears throat> making so. an outstanding catch, and unfortunately, it basically cost him the season. <laughs> yeah. So before we get talk with uh, Janine about to set up the 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 matchup uh, for Thanksgiving, uh, we got to we got to talk about the defense because obviously the defense had a played a huge part in this in, in this win. Mm-hmm. Um, what what else can we say that we've all, what is there anything else that we can say that, that we haven't already said? Uh, Wesley Sutton absolutely mm-hmm. crushed Taylor Cornelius with a beautiful sack. Mm-hmm. Wasn't that the that one? Just, yeah, there wasn't that the one hit where it was like nobody was there and I'm gonna get you. Yeah, like he he was all by himself and Sutton was just had to just beelined it right to Cornelius and yeah. just absolutely took him out. And again, that made it third and long, and the Elks had no choice but to kick it away. It yes. Yeah. No, uh, uh, Mike Moore also had a quarterback sack. Uh, Darius Pickett, uh, Armando Sewell. I mean, like, it was a good day. If you were a former member of the Edmonton football team, you had a pretty good day. I think you. I, I think we also mentioned this too on the Turf District. Was a lot of former Elks or Edmonton footballers mm-hmm. were, were making a return, and some of them for the first time since being traded or signing with Montreal as free agents or what have you. But they had to be a little bit motivated, and sure enough, you saw it in their play that there was a lot of guys that really stepped up and really they really wanted to keep Edmonton. In, they really wanted to keep that that losing streak going for them. And you know, credit to these guys, they they stepped up and made plays happen, and that's what we want. We want to see guys that on this defense that just make plays happen, and that's exactly what they did last Saturday. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we, we had, I, double, I double-checked it, we had a few more DPIs more than we, we should have had. Um, it's, it's It still needs to be cleaned up. It's better than last year. It's better than earlier in the year, um, but it still needs to be cleaned up. Uh, they, need, they need to play almost perfect football going forward with these next two series because, remember, folks, they got two... Back to back home and home series, one versus the Red Blacks and one versus the Toronto Argonauts, which could be huge considering with the win, the Alouettes are now two points behind. Two points behind. I don't think anybody thought this was going to happen, but two points behind the Toronto Argonauts after their shellacking in uh, Calgary this past week. Oh, yeah. And the Alouettes are also now seven and seven. Mm-hmm. Hey, five, five, they're playing 500 football, which. Not really something to be celebrating, but at the same time, considering how things are in the CFL East, I mean, 7-7 seven and seven now, and now they're in a posi- position. They can finally lock up a home playoff game with a win this coming Monday. So I'd say the pressure's on. I think they realize they know what they have to do. And what better way to do it? What better way to celebrate Thanksgiving than being at home in front of hopefully 20,000 plus of your closest friends and family, yep. get the win against Ottawa, and be able to say, yes, we are 100% hosting a playoff game. We don't know which one. Could be the Eastern Final. See, that's the, the cool thing final. about it. That's the cool thing about it. We don't know which one yet. That's how close we are. That's why these next four games are obviously very important. But you know what, Cliff? Before we talk about what could happen, let's set, let's set up the game itself. As I mentioned before at the top of the show, we have Janine from the Mouchoir podcast. Let's bring her in, Cliff. Let's talk with her and and let's set up the matchup. And uh, when we and when we're done, we'll preview 
the, th- the Thanksgiving Day Classic for Monday. And joining us on the line is a fellow member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network from the Mouchoir Podcast. We are thrilled to be able to talk Ottawa Red Blacks football with the one and only Ottawa J. Janin. Janin, welcome back to the Alouette's Flight Deck. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm glad at least one of us is thrilled to talk about Ottawa Red Blacks football. <laughs> <laughs> It wouldn't make a very good interview if all we were doing was saying "mouchoir." Uh, right. <laughs> oh, sigh. <laughs> Big sigh. I mean, I, mean, I mean, if you want, I can go get a chainsaw and just start revving that a few times. Maybe that might. We're, we do well, that already. Nice. We're, we're stealing that. All, we're stealing their shtick in Montreal. We do that already. <laughs> I, are you really doing a chainsaw? Well, someone's got to use it. We're not. Our chainsaw doesn't get a lot of use here at TDP, <laughs> so I guess someone has to use it. Uh, but in all seriousness, it's super nice to get to talk to you guys again and uh, talk about uh, what is we all hope is going to become the big rivalry between the Red Blacks and the Montreal Alouettes. One hundred percent. It's uh, it started with uh, Labor Day. That's you know with with all the other teams that are pairing up. Uh, the natural progression seems to be for Ottawa and Montreal to, to have that four seventeen four seventeen rivalry happening. So, mm-hmm. and now Thanksgiving Day. The, you're always guaranteed to have a game <laughs> on Thanksgiving Day in Montreal. So why not invite Ottawa to a party and let's. Let's see what how it goes. Let's see if we can't uh, make this a true rivalry and start of a new tradition. Absolutely. And it's it's such a nice short hop from Ottawa to Montreal. It's an easy day trip. So I'm all for Thanksgiving Monday from here on in CFL. Book it. Just book it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's make this a thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's talk about the Red Blacks, Jen. And as painful as it might be, it's, it's, it's fair to say that uh, – since 2019, things have not gone as well as our nation had hoped it would. I mean, how do you even begin to sift through everything that's happened and say, where did it all go wrong? Oh, yeah. Sift through is a really good way to kind of describe what I think a lot of Red Blacks fans have been doing with their feelings for the last little while. Um, it's it's interesting when I think back as a fan who's followed the team, so first of all, the success we had in the early years was absolutely wonderful. And we were all just so fortunate that, you know, first year 2014, obviously, you know, two and 16 season, the team kind of had to find its feet, but was packing the stadium every single game. And it was like every, it was the most exciting thing in town, followed quickly by the 2015 and obviously 2016 season uh, where we had the biggest success in the Grey Cup. I think there was just this feeling in the fan base that, holy, we are on to something. Football in the nation's capital is taking off with a vengeance. And then Henry Burris wisely, I think, chose to retire when he did, when he was at the top of his game after winning his second Grey Cup. And we just never quite recovered from losing Henry Burris. Um, Yes, we got back to the Grey Cup again in 2018 with Trevor Harris. But there's something about losing Henry Burris that I would argue was the start. That was the kind of first thread that got pulled. Uh, and then with the how the Trevor Harris contract was managed in the 2018-2019 offseason, uh, that's when the wheels really, really and truly started to fall off. And when you listen to Oseg speak publicly, they do talk about the hole they dug themselves into in 2019 with bad management decisions that were made around the roster and have never been able to pull themselves out. I I would argue, though, that losing Henry Burris seems to have been something we just could not get over. Now, it's not for lack of effort as far as uh, Oseg and the this year's new general manager, Sean Burke, is concerned. I mean, the, this entire roster, for the most part, was retooled. A lot of free agents were brought in. A lot of changes were made. I mean, on paper, this mm-hmm. looked like the team to beat and uh, is... Can you look at any reason as to why it just didn't gel? I mean, was it truly coaching or was it just the fact that, you know, just assembling a whole bunch of all star, like an all star team of players just doesn't always work? Yeah, I mean, I really do think and and Michaela and I had a free agency episode um, after 
the big crazy amount of signings and if anybody listened to that episode we were positively giddy like it was if you can win free agency which obviously doesn't matter for anything the Ottawa Red Blacks won free agency they shored up everything that was a massive weakness in 2021 um, and it really looked like okay we expected the team would take a couple games to gel but I don't think anybody expected this and so you kind of do have to go back and think about the coaching. The only thing that didn't change was the coaching staff. Everything else was almost entirely overhauled. And I am a big personal fan of Paul Lapolis. Um, I've liked him since he was the head coach of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And I know that might even sound weird because he didn't have that much success there either. But I've always really liked him. But there's just unfortunately something I don't know if he wasn't able to mobilize the team. I don't know if he didn't have the room. I think he probably had too much on his plate keeping offensive coordinator and head coach and couldn't really do either job 100% well. And we saw that in play calling. We saw that in management of game time decisions. Um, And so I do think you have to lay a certain amount of the blame on the coaching staff for where we see ourselves this season. And by the way, you bring up Lapo. I just wanted to ask because you know, we were actually talking about this um, two weeks ago with the guys over at the Turf District podcast during their overtime segment. What do you think it w- it was the correct time to fire Lapo? Because you know the CFO really is their history when it comes to f- coaches being fired during the regular season is is rare. Really is mm-hmm. rare considering how bad some teams have actually been in the CFL. Um, was it the right time to fire? Was it the right time to fire him? Yeah, I think so. And look, earlier on in the season, even when we were 0-6, Michaela, people were already calling for him to be fired. And Michaela and I at the time were saying, I think he gets a chance to turn things around this season. I don't I don't think we fire him for a bad start to the season as long as things keep trending in the right direction. And then we got a win. And then we strung together two back-to-back wins. And in a letter that Sean Burke wrote to the fans and season ticket holders yesterday, he actually gives a bit of insight into why they chose now versus a little bit earlier when maybe arguably we could have had a chance to salvage a playoff hope. And the reason he gave is, you know, we won those two back-to-back games and we seem to be building momentum. And all of a sudden with the state of the East, it looked like we actually had a legitimate chance and we wanted to give Lapo the shot to pull us out of it. And then we've just had like, honestly, three of the worst games of football that I've ever watched. And I watch a lot of football, as you guys know. (laughs) Um, And so now it's a question of not just, we can't salvage this season. I think nobody's under any illusions there, but the fans are so upset. You guys, it's like, it's wild. Even people like me who are normally pretty patient and level headed are having discussions about whether or not we buy season tickets next year unless something changes because it's just awful football to be watching this last couple of games. So I think they had to do it as much for salvaging um, and maybe even regaining some trust in the fan base and to also show their players, look, this isn't working. We're going to try something different. We're going to try to give you a little bit of something to believe in for the rest of the season. So I think the timing, they could not wait until the end of the season and, I think the timing was what it was, but I don't have any problems with it. I think, too, that, you know, I think Ottawa fans were just, they were. I think they were finally saying, we're, we're beyond being the Ottawa Renegades. We're beyond being oh. the Ottawa Rough Riders, what they were, how, you know, how, the garbage teams that they were before they folded. Um, you know, as you said, look how many times they went to the Grey Cup. You know, yeah. they, you know it, it was just... It's tough. I mean, as you know, I mean, Cliffy and I and, and Alouette fans have, have gone through the same thing very recently, mm-hmm. too. And mm-hmm. it's just you you wonder again. It, it's, yeah. it's it's like Ottawa is in the same boat as the Alouette organization was a few years ago. And it's like they're I think not even today. They're still trying to make sure that, they, that they're bringing back fans. And we're, we're finally getting there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, one, the one thing I wanted to ask you, Janine, is like if. Okay, you go back to 2020. Yes, there was no, no, obviously no season in 2020 because of the pandemic. Do you think there was one part of that roster that if the team had kept the coach, or as I well, you said, they stayed together, but a player, do you think that w- that might have helped? Because, you know, players signed with teams in 2020 thinking they were going to play and they ended up playing with them. 
Do you think there, mm. would, there would have been one player that if the uh, if the Renegades would have? Uh, sorry, Renegades. <laughs> it's okay. Well, they're playing like the Renegades. Yeah, as an honest mistake. Freudian, <laughs> Freudian slip. Uh, but the Red Blacks. I mean, is there a player that if the Red Blacks had kept from 2020, or you know, if they had played in 2020, would do you think it would have been any different? You know. That's a great question, but one that I'd never thought of before. But I would say off the top of my head, the one thing I noticed about 20, between 2020, they didn't play, and 2021, is a lot of players re- announced their retirement, mm-hmm. not just on the Ottawa Red Blacks. Like, this was happening across across the league. And the one that sticks out in my mind, um, and I, I hope I don't sound all fangirl, because I think everybody knows that I've always been a big fan of Brad Sinopoli. But the one that sticks out in my mind is Brad Sinopoli. And look, he's not hes not the flashiest receiver. He's not the best receiver this league has ever had. But what I will say is he was a leader on the offense. Um, and he put in the work, and he was also a thousand-yard receiver in a couple of seasons in a row, but he was a leader in that locker room. And we lost almost everything on offense between 2019 and 2021, mm-hmm. like almost everything. And in 2021, we had nobody on offense that could be relied on as a leader on that field. So I'm going to put Brad's name out there because I think if you, not that his play was so amazing that it could change the course of the season, but his leadership and his quiet ability to rally the guys and get them, you know, working together, there was nobody to do that in 2021. And so I think that we missed brad a lot more than we realized we would once he was gone that's, that's actually that's a very good answer that's a very good answer cliff <laughs> and i do love brad so i i love the opportunity to plug him <laughs> <laughs> well you've you certainly never hidden your uh, your admiration for uh, for old brad so <laughs> no <laughs> uh what about the quarterbacking situation it's kind of funny to me that uh at the end of the twenty, uh, well, going in, going into that off season of twenty twenty, before we knew that the world world was going to collapse onto it in, on, into itself, n- the out uh, the uh, the Red Blacks actually traded for the rights to Nick Arbuckle, giving mm-hmm. up the first overall pick to be able to sign this guy, only to sign him. He never plays for Ottawa, ends up getting released, and then two years later, Nick Arbuckle comes back to the Red Blacks. I mean, yeah. Yeah, like, it's quite the journey for him, eh? <laughs> I mean, honestly, as far as, like, is, is this the right system for him? Or is it just, um, is he really just sort of a, like, a seat warmer, so to speak? Like, just kind of keeping things warm until Jeremiah Masoli recovers and returns in 2023? Yeah, I, um, I'm not, I've never been sold on on Nick Arbuckle, Um even when we signed for his rights and then uh, I, I was also not sold on Matt Nichols, by the way, but, and, and I probably would have preferred that we kept Arbuckle over Nichols, but um, Arbuckle had great success as a backup quarterback and um, too soon, everybody thought he could be a starter and he has proven that he's not a starter yet in this league. And I'm not entirely sure that he will ever be a starter in this league. And I don't say that to be mean. I just think the proof is in the pudding we didn't keep him ultimately in Ottawa. And I think that's because Lapo had a loyalty to Matt Nichols and a knowledge of Matt Nichols style of play, but Arbuckle wasn't kept in Toronto. He wasn't kept in Edmonton. Um, Like he's, he's not, there's no coach that has, and when Dickinson gives away a quarterback, you have to ask yourself, whoa, what else does he have behind Arbuckle? Because Calgary is known as the quarterback, you know, machine in the league. So there's, there's something about Nick Arbuckle that every other team has recognized. He's just not the guy to start. And I don't think he was brought to Ottawa to ever be the guy to start. I think he was brought to Ottawa in an emergency situation in case things with Caleb Evans didn't work out. Things with Caleb Evans, I would argue that Caleb Evans still has a lot of potential to be developed in this league. And I would prefer to see Caleb Evans get the start against Montreal because I don't think Arbuckle will have a place on this team next year when Mazzoli's back. And if I had my choice between Arbuckle and Evans, I would choose Evans. I would also love to see Tyree Adams dress for a game, put him out there. Let's see what he's got and let's see if he's worth developing as well. But I think it's time. I think I, I sound harsh in my own head as I'm listening to myself say this, but I think the Arbuckle experiment in Ottawa did not work. 
Um, and we have to decide who we want to go with as our legitimate backup and who we want to develop. And I'm on team Caleb Evans for that. Well, listen, you're, you're no harsher than what I've been with when it, rec- when it comes to Trevor Harris. I mean, yeah. yeah. And again, I, I never say anything to be negative or dismissive of him. It's just, like I said, I just don't think he's the future and people mm-hmm. don't seem to want to accept that other than, Oh, you're just a hater, which is, uh, I, I just don't get it. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I know Trevor Harris well because because uh, he was with us for a few years, and he can be an incredibly frustrating quarterback, and then he can be an incredibly brilliant quarterback. But it's the consistency week in and week out, and that's what you need in a leader. Um, we hope we get that when Jeremiah Mazzoli is back in 2023, because that's who we're going to roll with for sure. Uh, but I totally hear you about Trevor Harris. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about Bob Dice being named the interim head coach uh, for the rest of the 2022 season. Uh, personally, I think it's a great move. Uh, I know he's had experience as interim head coach uh, for whatever reason. He never seems to be able to get that interim tag taken off. Like he's very good at kind of getting you through to the end of the season, but ultimately never really being considered as a head coach. What do you think he's going to have to do to prove that and convince Oseg to take that interim tag off and let him be the man in Ottawa? Yeah, that's uh, that's certainly um, something that we tackled this week on on our recording was um, was Bob Dice the right choice? And I agree with you, Cliffy. I think he was the right choice. Um, it was really between him and Benavides. And when you look at the teams, special teams in Ottawa over the past three very bad seasons have been the most consistent, the most successful, the most disciplined. And that's because of Bob Dice. Like Bob Dice has that unit, like a well-oiled, functioning like a well-oiled machine. And that's his coaching style. Uh, And he's being rewarded for that with the interim tag right now. So I think he's looking at this next four games as kind of his opportunity to show what he's capable of bringing to the entire team versus just his unit. Um, And I expect, I expect that we will, we will, well, I hope we will see that he can bring to the whole team, the same consistency and discipline that he has brought to special teams here in Ottawa. Um, And I like the choice of him. So, you know, I, I wish him an an awful lot of luck. Uh, I'm sure he's using this as an audition. Interestingly enough, though, and this again, this is not it's not a reflection on Bob Dice. It's more just sometimes I think we have a tendency to recycle old coaches Mm -hmm. versus going out and seeing what the new young talent is. And you look at someone like Mark Killam, who's been waiting in the wings for years, who is also a fantastic special teams coordinator. Like, I wonder if we should be thinking about that for next season and really starting to see who is the up and coming coaching talent out there. Um, That's a big risk for Sean Burke, who is a new general manager to take. Um, But I do hope he considers some of that. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't be Bob Dice next year. We'll have to see over the next four games, but I hope it's not locked in. I hope they're being very considerate and thoughtful in, in the search for the next head coach and that we think about some of the next generation of coaches because Mike O'Shea, was that once, mm-hmm. and now look at him. And you know what, guys? Maybe Michael Shea is tired of winning and wants to come and turn around another team. Maybe he'll come to Ottawa. Wouldn't or, that be amazing? Or even <laughs> hey, even Kahari, even Kahari. Because oh we, well, I mean, yes to Kahari. <laughs> I, I think Kahari. I really wanted him to come here as our offensive coordinator after you guys let him go, but Hamilton was way too fast for me. <laughs> yeah, that that makes us think that something's going on with uh, with Steinauer. That there may be same here. Yeah, but we'll we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's mm-hmm. uh, this uh, this. Will be an interesting off season for who's going to fight for whom when it comes to coaches who don't have that much head coach experience, but yet have a lot of CFL pedigree to them. So it's as, yeah. But, but I agree with you, by the way, Janine. I, yes, I understand football is football. It's not necessarily who you know. It's what you know, and then it, then it's who you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think there does need to be some change when it comes to. Uh, to coaches we need to let some of these new guys try i mean mm-hmm. you can still have a rookie head coach but with a great set you know a set of coaches behind you that have a ton Absolutely. of CFL experience mm-hmm. yeah exactly the the one thing the one thing i want more than anything honestly like even more i'm more concerned about this than i am about who is the head coach in a way and that's 
I want an off one offensive coordinator. None mm-hmm. of this three headed monster that we saw in 2021 and none of this double duty between head coach and offensive coordinator that we saw this year, which hamstrung us enormously. I want a head coach and I want an offensive coordinator. <laughs> and that's it. I just want that. <laughs> Yeah. No, well, unfortunately, yeah. The, the sad reality, though, is uh, with this uh, bloody coach's I salary know. cap, I mean, it, it you almost have no choice. You pretty much have to have someone that can wear multiple hats, which is mm-hmm. unfortunate and really, truly does, I think, kind of lessens the quality and also, too, doesn't give the opportunity for a lot of these head coaches to come up or these coordinators to sort of take that next step, like go from being like an offensive quality assistant to becoming possibly like a receivers coach or a quarterback coach or God forbid, even an offensive coordinator. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not wrong there at all. Cliffy, I would say in Ottawa, we have an awful lot of assistant coaches though, like an awful lot. And, and you know what, maybe I should take that back and maybe I should actually look and see if it compares to other teams, but I've always felt like we have, a, we have quite a few assistant coaches, which is great from a developmental perspective, but it, it gets you into trouble with the cap for sure. And speaking of offensive coordinator, uh, has has uh, the Red Blacks mentioned anything about who will actually be doing the play calling for the team going forward? Not yet. They announced yesterday that Corey McDermott is coming on board as an assistant special teams coach. So Bob Dice will be keeping the coordinator role, but is bringing in help on special teams. Uh, and we're all waiting with bated breath Um to see if he has named his offensive play caller and we haven't seen anything yet. So with our luck, gentlemen, it'll happen right after you guys hit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hit stop. Right, right <laughs> after we hit stop. Exactly. <laughs> well, well, my thought would be is this, is that if, if you know, you or your uh, co-host could have been at practice, cause I would imagine today would be their first day of practice for the red blacks. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I, I still haven't seen a report either way. For injury report or not, usually the CFL has put something out like this. But so far, nothing from the Ottawa camp and nothing from the Alouettes camp yet when it comes to practice. So, nope. So, just, dra- know. just dragging your heels. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are your? What, you know, Cliff and I had earlier this year. We had issues with with you know people who, um, you know, the players that, that we felt that should have made the roster that didn't make the roster, and and and. I don't know how you guys were when it came to the final picks for the Red Blacks this year, but you know you had a uh, speaking of you know of you know guys who have a lot of experience. You know you had a BJ Cunningham who you guys had picked up Mm -hmm. through free agency and was released. And I'm just going to use it because it just happened. And now, and Cliff Cliff and I were questioning it. Now they pick up Quan Bray. Mm -hmm. Um, Do do you think that? They were players. I mean, you, you two may have gone through this because you know I didn't hear you, what you guys thought about your final rosters at the beginning of the season. But were there players that you thought that should have made the team that didn't? I think we were maybe a little bit surprised when we saw the BJ Cunningham uh, release. But then again, there was so much talent that was brought in at wide receiver that you had to release somebody. Mm-hmm. Like we knew, we knew after free agency they weren't going to keep everybody. Um, hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, I do wonder if B.J. Cunningham might have fit in a little bit more than a Darvin Adams, who has not really been super consistent uh, this year. Um, and so, you know, you can't know that at the time, but maybe maybe that was a mistake that we made. Um, I've certainly been a little bit disappointed in, in Darvin Adams, who was one of the bigger signings. But I think we were fairly like we were we were just so thrilled with all the signings in the off season, and we kind of just knew like we're going to have to lose some of these names. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, B.J. Cunningham was a bit of a surprise to me. I've always been a fan of his. I, uh, I I think you guys know this, but in the East, you know, when it can't be Ottawa, the Alouettes are kind of who I follow and who I cheer for. Um, and so I've been watching B.J. for for a while. Um, yeah, I was a little sad to see that one go. Yeah. And then just recently you picked up Quan Bray. Yeah. Which just today, actually. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. uh, any any thoughts on on Quan? Um, well, I honestly haven't seen him play in a little while. So um, liked liked what I saw uh, from him in previous seasons, for sure. The thoughts I have are more around um, 
what are we going to, what, what is Bob Dice planning to do to shake things up on offense mm-hmm. here? And I think this is, I think we're entering the phase of the season where we're trying new things that might stick next year. And so clearly our offense has struggled despite all the talent. Uh, and so we're bringing in some fresh faces to the Ottawa Red Blacks and we're going to mix things up and, and see what can happen. So my thoughts were maybe less about uh, Quan Bray himself and more about, I think this is just a sign that we're, we're firmly in let's try new things for the 2023 season and and see what what we can learn and discover over the next four games. Yeah, cuz uh, cuz Cliff, you know, uh, I I I sent Cliff a, a text when I saw the thing come across the wire and he just sent me back a, a one word uh, answer and it was why. I mean, and it, <laughs> and it's a very good question. You know, cuz yeah. you know with the rosters have already been expanded themselves, you know, they could have put him on the practice roster already. Hell, they could have even picked up BJ, but mind you, you know, he wasn't picked up by anybody at all either. I know. Which was a, you know, and, and you know, the one that we were talking about before was, you know, Fabian Guerra. Nobody picked him up until recently and BC picked him up. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a, when it comes to a interim head coach, seeing what, you know, obviously you want the team to surprise, you know, it leads the, us into the Thanksgiving Day Classic on Monday. Um, I, I didn't mention this to Cliff, but it, and I've said it before, you know, the, the, we're at a point in the season now for the Alouettes where they need to be careful of these trap games. And, and, and you know, yes. you look at what's happening this season. They have two back-to-backs to end the season. And the Alouettes really do not have a very good track record as of late when it comes to potentially, uh, you know, making that final leap into first place. But they have two games against a, uh, I would hope, a hungry Red Blacks team coming into Montreal. Then we're going to be heading back to uh, to, uh, to TD Place to play. Um, what what are you hoping for when it comes to the Red Blacks? You know this this Monday. Well, I'm I am very excited to see the difference in the players with Bob Dice. Um, Cause one of the things that we noticed in the last few games, which were really bad losses was just the body language of the players. Uh, just this sense of dejection, the sense that they didn't even want to be there playing. And I am hoping that I see a spark. I'm hoping that Bob Dice brings a bit of a spark to the players. So I'll be watching for that. What is their attitude? What is their body language? Are they having fun out there? So, um, you know, it's not, I know it's not, you know, <laughs> it's not minor league and it's not, this is about when this is a professional league. It's about winning, not fun, but let's be honest. The red blacks have not been having any fun at all the last few games. And I do want to see that spark because I think that spark is important to winning and creating a winning culture. You have to enjoy it out there. So that's the first thing I'm looking for. The second thing I'm looking for is like, we have had a lot of luck in Montreal. We seem to like playing in Montreal. uh, And I think we can take it. You're right. You guys need to be careful of the trap games. Um, And this could absolute has all the makings of a potential trap game. Um, no worst team in the league just lost their head coach. Like there's so many reasons why the Ottawa Red Blacks should be just out and out ruled out, but they play well in Montreal for whatever reason. Um, And I'm hoping we can count on that along with a little tiny bump from some excitement and some buzz around a new coach. So that's what I'll be looking for this weekend. Yeah. Cliff. No, there's no question. Uh, I mean, this, this game is, I think the pressure really is on Montreal because essentially it's win and you're in. You win this game yeah. and you are guaranteed a home playoff game, no matter what. Mm-hmm. For Ottawa, this is a chance, as you said, just to throw stuff against the wall, see what sticks. You know, maybe start thinking about okay, what's 2023 going to be like? Whether it's a new coaching staff or maybe change up the players again, or just determining which players you have that you want to keep. I mean, there's this is a pretty important game for the Red Blacks too, when you think about it. Oh, for sure. It's a pretty important game to just like get back into that, that belief that this team can build something and it it can't salvage this season. I know mathematically, technically they're not out, but they're out because they have to rely on a whole lot of other dominoes falling. And that's like, that's not, but they have an opportunity to try to salvage some hope and some belief that Whatever Sean Burke's vision is, he keeps talking about the vision that he has, that it's the right vision and that they're all going to be able to work towards that and that 2023 will be better. And that's all we can hope for at this stage, honestly. And of course, uh, the Mushuar podcast, I mean, I know you you and uh, Michaela has 
you know, you've done a great job trying to stay as positive as possible. I mean, you know, you're, you're honest, but at the same time, you can hear that there's like just that hope that, you know, things will get right and things will sort themselves out. And, you know, I love the fact that you guys are still willing to get out there each and every week. I know it can't be easy. It's uh, Tim and I can do test. It's not fun to talk yes. about losing football, yeah. but for you guys to be out there, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping not necessarily for an Ottawa win. I just, I just can't do that, but <laughs> I just hope that you guys can find positives and find a way to help keep our nation informed as well as, you know, just give them something to go with. Something to say, like, you know what, okay, this year's a wash, but, man, let's focus on this, let's focus on that, and 2023 could very well be our year again. Yeah, and, and you know, it's the life of a fan. Um, it, it doesn't go well every year. Uh, unfortunately, we're at the – it feels rock bottom because it's the end of three years, but – um, but thank you for that, Cliffy, because we do try. We do try to still keep a spark and, and a love of football alive, even when times are tough. And we've actually recently added, uh, we're now a trio starting this week. We've added uh, Josh Buchert, who is actually in my section. He's a season ticket holder, sits right in front of me. And he filled in a couple times for Michaela and then once for me when I was gone. And we decided, you know what, like we do need to inject a bit more positivity. And so some fresh, <laughs> some fresh perspective uh, on the podcast is a good thing. And so we're hoping that that helps keep us all going. <laughs> Misery loves company. Right? <laughs> well, it's funny. I was actually about to ask you, did you and, Mc and or Michaela perchance plan a voyage out of the country? Because it seems like that's when the Red Blacks seem to win. I know. You guys it's, are out. Uh, it's Michaela. It's Michaela. When she's out of the country, we win. So I should tell her to get the hell out of here for Thanksgiving and, you know, <laughs> frankly, for the month of October. She should just leave. <laughs> well, listen, if it, if it works and they, the, the Red Blocks run the table, you, you just never know, right? Like you said, right? they're not mathematically eliminated. So mm -hmm. strange. This is the CFL. Strange things happen every single day. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Oh, well. Janine, this has been an absolute blast. We definitely love having you on here. Let everybody know where they can find you and Michaela, whether it comes to the Mouchoir podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you. I also always have fun talking uh, talking with you guys uh, about football. You can find our podcast uh, anywhere that you listen to podcasts. It's called Mouchoir, a Red Blacks podcast. Uh, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Mouchoir Podcast. Uh, you can find me at Ottawa J, uh, that's J A Y, and you can find uh, Michaela at Shrides, uh, and you can find our newest edition at Josh Buchert on Twitter as well. And so, uh, feel free to give us a give us a holler any old time. All right, there you go, Our Nation. There's your queen right there. Ah, thank you, Cliff. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> thank you again for joining us, Janine. We definitely appreciate it. And hey, let's just let's not focus on the rivalry on Monday. Let's just focus on the fact. That there's going to be turkey. There's going to be football. There's going to be We've poutine in a helmet. Poutine in a helmet. Yeah, there you I got to go. get down there to try this poutine in a helmet stuff that you guys got going. And I, I haven't looked at the weather forecast, but I'm really hopeful that it's a beautiful, crisp fall day, which is the perfect football day. It, it looks it. Um, it looks it. I've been changed. Oh. I've been I've been looking at it myself, and it's like at one point earlier this week it was supposed to rain. I was like, no. no! But right, right no, now they're calling for a high of 12 and sunny. That's perfect. I'll take That's that. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Anytime you're in the positives and sunny, I'll take that all day long. Agreed. You bet. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Janine. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of the show. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Cliff, this woman knows her football. Uh, I think it's the second time we've had Janine come on and talk, talk about the Red Blacks. Again, she knows her stuff. Great having her on, and, and we'll have her on again for sure. Oh, 100%. Just an absolute blast to talk. And I know it can't be easy because, let's face it, the Ottawa Red Blacks this year, it's not great over there in uh, the nation's capital. But Janine somehow still manages to put a positive spin on things. Still has that hope. Still ho still wants to believe that you know they're on the right path. It's just a matter of things just have to start falling in, into place for them. So I hope for her sake it's it's true and that they do actually get their, their act together sooner rather than later. But, uh, yeah. Always a pleasure to have Janine on and, uh, you know, always look forward to chatting any kind of football with her. Yeah, exactly. Now, I didn't bring it up during the during our chat, and I guess I wanted to save it for our, our preview here for the game on Monday. Um, obviously, first and foremost, we haven't heard anything, because I mentioned before, they've not practiced yet. Um, 
and I've said that I brought this up a few times before. We know how important these games are, and as I mentioned during the the interview, is that the, you know the Alouettes have in their recent history they really have not been able to take advantage of certain situations as uh, uh, you know that they in that they've been given. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've already said this, and I've and I know we've used this analogy, and I've used this this uh, example many times before. But Cliff is based on where the Alouettes currently are. And the current situation that the Red Blacks are in, is this a Canada, Canada Day game 2005? Is this, is this a trap game? Because remember, if nobody remembers what happened on Canada Day 2005, the Alouettes got upset by the Renegades. I think they blew a, they blew a huge lead in that game, too. Mm-hmm. Is, this a, is this a trap game? Are the Alouettes, God forbid they aren't, but could they be looking past the Red Blacks to that home and home series versus Toronto in three weeks. I really hope not considering you do still have to win to get into the playoffs. And that's the thing. That's all you have to do is just win the game on Monday and you qualify for a home playoff game. No less. As I said, it'll be either the Eastern semifinal or Eastern final. We don't know which one yet, but you you'll qualify. So I, I don't see this as a trap game. I think the Labor Day game, the Labor Day weekend game, was I felt more of a trap game, and look what happened there. I, I I really think that they couldn't get their act together, and Ottawa was able to take advantage. They didn't play much better either, but they found their groove and they they ran away with the game. And I think Montreal realizes that they have to remember that. I hope they remember what happened last year in the home finale. There's that too. I I, I mean, overall. The Red Blacks have enjoyed much success at Percival Molson Stadium, and I'm sure would love nothing more than to spoil the party. Because let's not forget, the Red Blacks are still mathematically alive in which the Grey Cup playoffs. Get, which I don't get. I don't get it either. I don't see how that's possible. I mean, I, is there any possibility that... Yeah, yes, I guess so. Yes. Yeah, there's four games left. Technically, they could both, the, the Owls could have 11 losses. That's right. Wow. Uh, I, I mean, again... I mean, so much would have to fall into place for the Red Blacks to even consider a postseason bid. But and that's got to be all the more reason for them to want to just slam the door on this team. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I I don't see this as a trap game, if only because I think the Alouettes know what they have to do. And realistically, if you're going to dog it for one game and and not risk anything, like not you want to expend all your energy for one game, it would have to be the, the next game, the game next Friday in Ottawa. Mm-hmm. I'd say get the, the W. The leftover bowl. Yep, that's right. <laughs> the leftover bowl. <laughs> to me, I, I think Montreal really has to focus on get the W at home, secure that X that goes next to your name for the playoffs. Yes. And whatever happens, happens after they that. They still I have mean, motivation. That's the thing. They still have motivation. Because, let's face it, the Elwoods are not going to back at back themselves into the playoffs like they did last year like no. last year they they fell into the playoffs essentially yeah they got a, i mean they got a six point lead on hamilton they are two points out of first place you know i mean yeah knowing full well it's divisional matchups only yeah you got two against two against ottawa two against toronto and there are so many implications i just don't think this team is going to take this this red blacks team lightly and they've got every reason to i mean they just fired their head coach. Uh, you got an interim head coach in place now. We don't know who the offensive coordinator, who the play caller is going to be for the Red Blacks. Uh, you'd think that's something you'd want to get shored up before you start your week of practice. But okay, I mean, they they ran a practice today in Ottawa and haven't heard too much about it. Oh, what, you know, I don't know if, what kind of indication there is other than getting a little bit of help uh, for special teams because Bob Dice, who was a special teams coordinator for the Red Blacks. Now he's the interim head coach, so he's brought in someone to help in that aspect of the field. Yeah, they picked up former, uh, as I mentioned in the in the uh, interview, they've also picked up former Alouettes wide receiver Quan Bray. Right, add him to the practice roster. I don't think we'll see him against Montreal unless something you know crazy happens. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Quan's Quan hasn't. I don't think he's done anything since being cut back no. in June. No, no, as far as we know. But I mean, happy to see him back in the league. Don't get me wrong. Oh but, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, no, I agree it, with you. If they're adding them, if the Red Blacks are adding them to try and get any sort of intel on the Alouettes, I just don't see that happening, yeah. quite frankly. I mean, yes, it, it's true. I mean, Alouettes are twenty are, are on Thanksgiving Monday are twenty one and eighteen on Thanksgiving Monday. 
Yeah. Yeah, they broke their streak last year. Uh, you know, they started started a new winning streak, which is what we want. Yep. You know, they played pla- the Red Blacks in a thriller. Yep. Yep. And uh, at home, <clears throat> excuse me, at home, the Alouettes are 16 and 15 overall on Thanksgiving Day. There. So to me, I think there's more than enough pressure. I think there's more than enough on the table that the Alouettes are not going to be looking past the Red Blacks by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. I realize on paper, I think the, the Alouettes are much better put together. But also, too, let's not forget that first game in Ottawa that Montreal played. I mean, that was a seesaw battle as well. And that could have gone either way. And true. Just, couple bounces here and there and that that win could have just as easily been a loss yeah so there's just something about this red blacks team that you cannot afford to take this these guys lightly regardless of all the shenanigans going on despite all the drama everything that's going on with the red blacks right now you cannot take this team lightly at all no i I don't think montreal will i agree by the way for those of you who who love the stats this will be the fifth different quarterback to coach the Alouettes on Thanksgiving Monday uh, since, well, since Cato did it back to back in 15 and 16. So, there, there's the, you know, so Harris will be the fifth different quarterback mm-hmm. in five years, six, well, five seasons, five seasons. No, nope. and it was uh, just about this time last year that the Alouettes acquired his services from Edmonton, of all places. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, AC uh, Vernon Vernon went well. No, it was after the Thanksgiving Day game. Vernon went down almost a year ago. Yep, that's what yeah. I said. Almost a year ago. Yep, was, uh, and and yeah, it's true. Yep. So, what are you looking for, dude? We're you looking forward to this game because uh, again, uh, it's it's scary because <clears throat> which Red Blacks team is going to come into this? You know, this has become a, a you know even though you know the Red Blacks have not been that good of, good of a team as you mentioned just met now they've been great games. You know, the past couple of years, they've been great games, no matter the record, no matter where mm-hmm. they are in the standings. You know, yes, nope. the Alouettes won three or four in 20, in 20, uh, 20, uh, 21, mm-hmm. but still. No, I, I think Montreal has to show how hungry they are. They, they cannot afford to get complacent. They cannot just coast in this game. I really want to see the ground game reestablish itself big mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. I, I think it, I, I think there's going to be enough pressure on trevor harris to get rid of the ball to not hang on to it I and mean, he's gonna have to even if all he does is dink and dunk his way downfield as we know he can do i mean just you've got Antwi, you've got fletcher uh won't have stand back just yet i don't believe but maybe we'll see i, I know that uh, danny mcchurch had talked about hopefully having william stand back back in the lineup uh in time for the thanksgiving day game could it happen we'll see but all this to say that you've got to get the ground game going big time. And I think that'll take a lot of pressure off of Trevor. Uh, yes, you, you know that you throw up the ball towards Gino Lewis and nine times out of 10, he's going to come up and make an outstanding play. That's great. But you you know, Ottawa secondary is going to be dialed in and focused on him. I, I really think with uh, Montreal, they just got to, they got to punch him in the mouth early, set the tone early and just not take their foot off the gas. I mean, it sounds cliche as heck to say, but I mean, that's really what Montreal has to do. Like they, they, they just got to own this game. They got to set the tempo right off the bat and not lose any control, not get complacent, not rest on your laurels and just, you know, half ass your way through things thinking you're going to win. I, I think really, truly, you got to make, you got to make a statement. You got to say, this is our house. This is Thanksgiving. This is our game. Mm-hmm. Cause let's face it. We don't have those Labor Day traditions like all the other teams do, but we do have Thanksgiving. Like this is the game that people get excited for. This is our tradition, as I mentioned before. When they when they when they took the game away from us in twenty in twenty nineteen, so we were on the road. It's like this is our this is our tradition. You know, they had that yeah. one one year blip with, with the Labor Day Classic where we played in it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, by the way, another quick stat, Cliff. This is the ninth different head coach in nine games on Thanksgiving. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Nine <laughs> different head coaches. On the last nine Thanksgiving Day Mondays. That's wild. <laughs> that, so, yeah. Uh, um, you, there was a line, uh, not on five dimes yet because it's too later on, but I think you, you mentioned that there was a line, an early line for this game that's currently available, right? Yeah, on Bet Regal, the Alouettes are favored by seven and a half points, which I think <laughs> sounds about right. I mean, when you consider that Ottawa just fired their head coach and uh, there's a whole lot of disarray, one would think. I mean, I think a. I think that's about where you'd want to set the line, quite frankly. So that might be the first line, though, of the week, too. No practice yet. It was there no, was there an over under uh, that you, that you saw? 
I, I didn't see. I just saw the uh, just the, uh, the the spread, and yeah, that's okay. That's all right. Um, reminder for the game. By the way, a reminder again. Saturday practice at the Big O. Go for the long weekend. You have the be- you know the, I think the weather's supposed to be it's supposed to be nice on Saturday. Head out to the Big O. Yeah, a little cool, but uh, it's, it's, it's projected to be uh, still nice and sunny. Yeah. So yeah, definitely uh, make your way out there, uh, see the guys in action. Uh, like I said, I think it's a walkthrough, or is that going to be on Sunday? That's going to be on Sunday. Well, typically, it's the day before they do the walkthrough. So yeah. This, yeah. this would still be an actual practice. It's, exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I would definitely say like you know come come on out uh, to the Big O, the the practice field between uh, the Big O and Stad Saputo. That's where you'll find the guys. Uh, yeah. You know, encourage them. I know they'll be thrilled to see you all. So uh, yeah, if you got nothing going on for the long weekend. You know, it's not turkey day for you just yet. Then come on out to the practice and uh, support these guys. Exactly. And and we found out with a big, this will be uh, a fan appreciation day at the, at the stadium. And to our surprise, Cliff, as we think we mentioned in the interview uh, with Janine, Poots and Helmets are back. Yeah. So, folks, if you missed out the first time around, and let me tell you, those helmets got snapped up super fast. Yeah, you got to be there. You got to be there at rope drop, at gate open. You got to be there. Gotsa, gotsta. Yeah, because uh, and I'm telling you right now, if there's anybody out there in the CFL universe that wants us to pick up these helmets, let us know. I mean, it'll cost you, but <laughs> we, yep, yeah, we, we can make it happen because yeah, these things will no doubt sell out fast. And because there's do- a lot of people. There's a lot of people that missed out. And I'm pretty sure now that they've got a second chance, they're not going to miss out again. Yeah, they they are changing it up slightly. Uh, make sure you do go see Joey Frieri's uh, story about the five reasons to come to the game. But as we also mentioned on our socials, um, that they will be not only available, I think, in two locations uh, as far as the concession stands go, but they will all, uh, a limited number will also be available at the main boutique. So you can buy with or without Putin. But why would you want to buy without boots in? My guess would be if, especially too, like if your turkey day is the Sunday and, you know, you're going to be stuffed, you know, hopefully. I mean, like you have all the goodies, all the fixings and everything like that. Maybe you're just like barely getting out of bed and just barely make it to the stadium on time. <laughs> and like, oh, I couldn't possibly eat anymore. And yeah, even though someone presents you with this gorgeous helmet with, you know, filled to the brim with puts in, you're like, oh, I don't want to eat, but I can't waste it. I was about to say, but Cliff, you know, it's put in. <laughs> exactly. You know, like. Because you know you're what? still paying the same price, by the way, fans, which I think, it, it, you know what? It makes it even of a better deal. That That's what I, how I read it. It said, whether you buy with the puts in or whether you buy without, it's still going to cost you the same price. Well, if that's the case, then I mean. Get the puts equal. in. Get the puts in, folks. I mean, jeez. Come on. How, how, I don't care. Even if you do gorge yourself on, on turkey and uh, stuffing and potatoes and all that good stuff, like how do you say no to puts in? Exactly. Really? Come on, man. Come and on. speaking of uh, Thanksgiving dinner, yes. uh, I would like to announce also too that the uh, the tailgate happening at the east side of the stadium uh, by uh, Les Gars Qui Vive, uh, they will be doing their deep fried turkey. So nice. By all means, folks, uh, everybody's welcome. Uh, come bring something to share with everybody. Uh, like I said, they're frying up turkeys all the way up till kickoff. Uh, always a great time. Another great Thanksgiving tradition as well. And uh, so yeah, technically it could be turkey, then puts in. Or, or if you're really enterprising, you save a little bit of that deep fried turkey, kind of smuggle it into the stadium, and sprinkle it on top of your puts in. Dude. I mean, pull pork turkey puts in. Dude. Hello. Wow. Wow. I'm telling you, that is Thanksgiving AF, as the kids would say. And if Kayla were here, we'd ask her if they do say that. Well, Kayla's not here, is she? <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you guys. We really do. Uh, email uh, if you want to email us to let us know what you think of the show, suggestions for, for the next show. And we've had a couple come in, by the way. We want to thank you for everybody for, for emailing us. Uh, you can email me at tim.capper at alouettesflightdick.ca or you can email cliff at clifford.pine at alouettesflightdick.ca. Let us know what you think. Um, are you coming? Uh, are you going to visit us? Uh, who we want on the show? Who you want to have on the show in the next couple of weeks? Uh, we always want to hear your feedback, good, bad, or other. 
Um, yeah. it's, it's all about, you know, getting the show to what you guys want and, uh, and making sure you guys enjoy the show. That's, that's the main thing. Yeah. And if you're on YouTube watching the show or listening to the show, make sure you leave comments there for us as well. We'll check them out. And again, good, good criticism, bad criticism. You, if you're happy, let us know. If you're unhappy, let us know too. We want to know, we want to hear all of your feedback so we can make an even better show for you guys. Exactly. So Cliff, I'll be seeing you, buddy. I'm sure you'll be stuff, stuff, but it doesn't matter. I'll be seeing you anyways, and we're going to get ready for the Thanksgiving Day Classic. I hope everybody takes a part of the uh, of this uh, Montreal tradition. Uh, if you do not show up, we, Cliff and I and everybody here at the Flight Deck want to wish you the happiest of Thanksgivings. And so for everybody here at the Owens Flight Deck for Cliffy D, I'm Tim Capper. Ron Final Approach. <laughs>